Okay, we now have the background necessary to talk about the inverse complex discrete Fourier transform. So, so far what we've been talking about is the forward complex discrete Fourier transform where we're given a signal and we take all these dot products and from that we obtain these coefficients. Um, there's one coefficient for each frequency in our um, Fourier basis and we plot these frequencies and we can see stuff about what frequencies are active in our signal. But actually, just given those frequencies, we can go back to our time domain representation. So just given all the coefficients of all the frequencies in my DFT basis, I can actually go back to a time domain representation. Um, what I have to do is sample a phaser at every single frequency um, scaled by the coefficient of that frequency and sum them up. So, so now the equation is going to be in terms of x of little n. So I'm going to say, okay, let me go backwards. I need to figure out what is my signal at sample n. Okay, well, I have to sum up all the phases. I'm going to sample every single phaser at a sample that's n into it. So start at the phaser of frequency 0. I'll go up to the phaser of um, frequency n minus 1. Um, and actually, there also needs to be um, this in front here, so I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. But Okay, so what this is going to be is I need to sample the phaser at frequency k. So that's e to the i 2 pi. Um, so that frequency is going to be k over the interval n. And I'm going to sample that phaser at the sample n that I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Um, I also need to scale this phaser by the coefficient that I found. And then I'm done. So let's look at this for a second. What's interesting is these formulas are very similar. Um, so if you kind of re reverse the role of, of time and frequency, you, you almost get the same thing. Um, the differences are that this one I divide by n. Um, and the reason is because because here, actually, when you do the dot product, um, the amplitude gets multiplied by the number of samples and gets split between um, the frequency k and, and its complex conjugate at n minus k. Um, so we need to we need to normalize this here. There's also a positive i instead of a negative i, but otherwise they're very very similar. But the interpretation is different. Here I'm taking a dot product of an entire, a single phaser sampled over the entire interval with all my samples. Here I'm saying it really is a dot product with my Fourier transform with with um, different frequencies. But another way to think about it is I'm sampling every single phaser, multiplying that phaser by the coefficient that I found but I'm only sampling it at n, okay, so at little n. Um, so that's the inverse DFT. So I want to show you, okay, so you, I'm not actually making you implement this. This stuff is in NumPy already. But I want to show you sort of what you can do with the inverse DFT. And on a homework three, you're going to be doing the inverse um, short time Fourier transform, where you actually do the inverse DFT in every single window. So you're, you're going to be able to manipulate um, the frequency domain and then go back to the time domain, having made some changes. But for now, I'll just show you that on a single window. So let's sample some noise. What I'm going to do is just make a bunch of random numbers sampled from a Gaussian. I'm going to make two seconds worth of them. Um, if we look at the frequency domain, the frequency domain looks like this. Um, let me actually store that in a variable. I'll call it big X. Um, and let me actually not just, yeah, let me store the whole thing. So, but I'm just going to plot um, the magnitude here. So we see, um, we do actually see a mirror symmetry here, if you look carefully. Uh, but, but actually one property of noise um, that, that's sampled this way is that it is expected to be even over all frequencies. Um, and actually... Yeah, it's it kind of it ends up having the same distribution as the original um, signal anyway, because this is an isometry, whatever. I can talk about that for those who are interested, if you want to know. It's kind of a linear algebra thing going on here in the background. But anyway, um, okay, let me do the following, though. Let me say I want to damp down the higher frequencies. So right now, this sounds like this. Just a bunch of static. What if I want to damp down the higher frequencies? Um, well, one thing I can do is just, let me make um, an array. I'll say, um, so I have n samples, so let me make, um, that means I also have n frequencies in the complex GFT. 
I'll make an array, I'll, I'll call it scale. I'll say so that's going to be equal to, um, I guess what I'll say is maybe one over, well, okay, so first I'll say np.0's n. I'll say the first, I'll say samples from one to int n over two, um, it should be equal to, let's see, I'll make it fall off by a certain amount. I'll say maybe one over um, one plus 0 0.1 times np dot a range int n over two minus one. What am I doing? Okay, I'll plot this in a second. Um, let's see, is that gonna do it? Okay, so that goes down a little too fast. Um, let me say maybe. Okay, so what I've done so far is I have. Okay, actually, let me just go one. Okay, I've made the first half here. I'm going to say I want to scale down all the frequencies in the first half like this. So they're going to fall off at that rate. I am actually need to mirror this on the other end. So I can say scale from negative one to negative int n over two, moving in increments of negative one is equal to scale from one to int n over two. You'll, you'll probably have to do some stuff like this in the homework. Okay, so anyway, I ended up with the mirror image here. Um, so let me try to um, now scale down this frequency response here. So I will say that um, x nu is equal to scale times x. So let's look at the magnitudes. Um, so let me see what the frequency domain looks like now. So this should be x nu. Okay, so I managed to scale down um, most of the higher frequencies. Actually, I guess I messed this up a little bit. Let me make sure I'm going, let's say n over two plus one and n over two minus one. Okay. Okay, that's that's really what I wanted, okay. So you have to really focus to, to get this totally right, but anyway. Okay, so let's listen to the inverse DFT of this. Um, first of all, how do I know that the inverse DFT is even going to be a real number? That's one thing I didn't mention here. Um, this is worth thinking about. Like, how do I know? I'm adding together, these are all complex numbers, these are complex numbers, I'm adding a bunch of them together. How do I know I'm gonna get a real number back? Um, well, the reason is because you actually have the complex conjugates. So the um, the k and the n minus k coefficients, they'll cancel out the imaginary parts, so you're only left with the real part. All right. So let me go back and let's listen to x new. I'll say is equal to mp dot fft dot ifft. So for inverse x new. Um, so we should see. Um, so we actually have very, very small, because of numerical problems, super, super small imaginary components here. We need to actually just kill them. So I'm just gonna say, as all, if you've done this correctly and, and you've actually made this the mirror image, because the complex conjugates cancel out, you should always have just a real signal. But because of numerical problems, you end up with um, some very, very, very tiny imaginary numbers. So just get rid of them, all right. So let's listen to this now. Let's see what this sounds like. So, okay, go back to the original real quick. Um, let me just uh, get rid of this, make some space for the original. Okay, so the original sounded like this. And now this one sounds like this. Do you hear how the higher frequencies kind of die down a little bit? You know, it sounds a little more bass heavy. I can make this fall off even more. Um, and you'll hear, hear even more bass. So let me keep this at this one here. Um, okay, let me, yeah, let me compare them all. So this is the one where I did, did that fall off and it sounded like this. Um, let me do another one where I do even a sharper fall off. So I will make it like this. 
Okay, so here's that one. So this is a rudimentary version of something called a low-pass filter that only retains the low frequencies. So we'll talk about these more over the next couple days, but I just wanted you to get an idea of, of how that worked and, and some of the issues that arise when we do the inverse discrete Fourier transform. Okay, so that's it for now.